Happy Thanksgiving, man, sorry, end of thanks, uh, excuse me, end of uh, November, and we're getting into December. Um, excited to preach today. Uh, I want to tell you guys about a woman. Her name is Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom was the daughter of a Dutch watchmaker who helped many Jews escape from the Nazis during the Holocaust in World War II by hiding them in their home. The family was caught and arrested and was sent to concentration camps. And Corey and her little sister Betsy were imprisoned together uh, in the miserable conditions of Barracks 28 and the Ravensbrück camp. Now, this camp was built for 250 people, but uh, at this time it was housing around 2,000 people with five to a bed and many more on the straw matted floor. Barracks 28 was a dilapidated structure with broken windows, soiled bedding, backed up plumbing, and bad tempered guards. Um, but the, the worst thing about Barracks 28 is that it was infested with fleas. Corey Ten Boom would later write a book about her experience at Ravensbrook called The Hiding Place, where she recounts how she found and shared hope in God in the midst of suffering and imprisonment. And somehow for her, it was the fleas that put her over the top. I mean, of all the misery and all the suffering and everything they were experiencing, she wrote, why? What possible purpose can fleas serve? I hate fleas. She wrote about how her sister one day came to her quoting a passage from 1 Thessalonians, give thanks in all circumstances. Uh, Corey quickly replied that she could not give thanks for the fleas. Betsy reminded her that she could give thanks that the two of them were together as most families had been split apart. Corey said, I can give thanks for that, but not for the fleas. You know, we've been a, in a series based on a word that God gave us a few months, uh, uh, actually about a month ago, um, about the season that we're in as a church. We've been calling this radical receiving. We believe that God is taking us into a three-month period of time uh, where uh, he's inviting us to receive more from him. And so the messages that you will hear uh, this month and actually going into the new year um, will be our attempt to weigh, to contemplate, to meditate on this word. And with the spirit of expectation and engagement, um, our desire is to posture ourselves um, to, to accept all that God graciously wants to give us. Amen. Amen. Let, me, uh, let me tell you something that I know about receiving from God. Um, and, and these themes are going to show up as we go through this message today. But I, I just want to give it to you now. Okay. Uh, the first thing is this, that you cannot receive what God wants to give you if your hands are already full. Did you hear that? You can't receive all that God wants to give you if your hands are already full. All right. The provision of God is unexpected, it's uncomfortable, and it's unconventional. There's always more that God wants to give you if you and I don't limit his hand. And his heart, the second thing is his heart is not to spoil his kids, right? He's not just trying to spoil us for the sake of spoiling us. All he does is for our spiritual formation and our character formation. Like God is committed to making you like Jesus. And I wanna show you how he does this through provision in this message today, amen? So we're going to look at 1 Kings 17. And in 1 Kings 17, we meet a king of Israel named Ahab, who the Bible says did more to provoke the Lord's anger than any king that came before him. All right? And so he enters into this diplomatic marriage with the daughter of a king of Tyre and Sidon in order to create an alliance. And once they're married, Ahab and his wife Jezebel established the worship of Baal and Asherah in Israel, replacing the worship of Yahweh. Uh, that they go on this systematic campaign to change the national religion by bringing in 400 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, and they put them on government salaries and they send them out to practice. And for the first time in Israel's history, right, while, while uh, Israel had always flirted with and had been tempted by neighboring nations' gods, um, although that has always happened, this was the first time the power structure of Israel, the, the king and queen, are leading the way in pursuing another God and intentionally cutting off the nation's ability to worship Yahweh. I mean, one chapter further, we're gonna look at 1 Kings 17 today, but, but just one chapter further in, 1 Kings 18, you will find Jezebel killing the prophets of Yahweh. I mean, this is a, a dreadful and dire time in Israel's history. And, and let me just, and I just wanna say this, um, you know, now that we are past the election, 
Can I, can I speak on it? Um, you know, what, what Ahab did in 1 Kings 17, creating an alliance through marriage, would be seen by many as a great political move. But the Bible gives him no such credit. To, to, to most who were around, to most who were watching the landscape of things that were going on, they, they would see him marrying this foreign woman and they would say, oh, that, that's a good political move. But the Bible doesn't give him any of that credit, right? Deuteronomy 7 actually says, you shall not intermarry with them for they would turn your sons from following me to serve other gods, which is to say that great political moves can never trump the commands of God. Do you see what I did there? Great political moves can never trump the commands of God. All right, they can't. See, the election results tell us that Americans believe that we have not been on the right track, right? And change was needed, right? But there's a percentage of us, if I can say this, there's a percentage of us that thinks that we just elected the second coming of Jesus. Tell me I'm wrong. Right. Now, I know there's a lot of reasons for us to be hopeful. All right. It, it looks like Trump's actually assembling the Avengers, right, for this new administration. Right. There's a lot to be hopeful for. Right. But I'm pretty sure the book of Psalms says, trust not in princes. Right. This is what it says. All right. I, I don't know who needs to hear this. I don't know who needs to hear this, but the kingdom of God will not arrive on the Air Force One. You understand that? It, it just won't. It won't. Right? We have elected a Jehu. Do you know what Jehu was? All right? Jehu was a flawed leader who was defeating a greater evil. We have not elected a Josiah. Okay? Josiah is a righteous leader who leads a national revival. As believers, we need to know the difference. All right? See, as believers, we have a greater allegiance to a greater king. And it's not a Jehu, it's not even a Josiah. You know who it is? Jesus. I'm not getting enough amens. I, that, that must hurt. I, I know, it's painful. It's painful. It's painful. Jesus, he is the righteous leader, right? He's the one who controls all things, no matter how bad things look. And the story we're going to look at today is an example. Okay, things were really bad. There, were, there was a a major need, a really important need for greater leadership. And even in the midst of everything that was going on, you're going to see how sovereign God is. Amen? So let's look at this together. All right, 1 Kings 17, starting in verse 1, says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. All right. Uh, this is the first mention of Elijah in the Bible. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, um, or, or if you're aware of how Elijah is talked about and referenced in the New Testament, you will know that Elijah is a legend. All right. He's a legend. The first verse gives us a lot of information about his origin story. Uh, the question is, how does this prophet come out of nowhere and stand toe to toe to Ahab and deliver such a harsh word. How is that? Uh, I want to break that down from this verse. So Elijah was a Tishbite from Tishbe. Uh, the Tishbites were settlers, all right? They were settlers. They intentionally migrated and journeyed from Galilee and settled as strangers in Gilead. Uh, the area of Gilead they settled in was a rural and set apart area. One, one commentary I read says that they were known as a rural pastoral community. Uh, the word uh, Tishbe comes from the Hebrew root meaning to return or dwell. All right, so what does this mean? This is what I think this means. That this means that Elijah didn't emerge on a scene as a man who could hear God's voice, know his word, and boldly declare it to whoever God wanted him to just out of nowhere. Right? Elijah belonged to a community of people who intentionally journeyed together. People who understood the cost of giving up everything to know God and dwell with God. It, it was from that place that he was armed and dangerous against the forces of the kingdom of darkness. And listen, this is my prayer for the Rock of Roseville. 
This is my prayer. I, I believe that we are called to be a community of people who intentionally journey together. We may have arrived here as strangers, right? But we entrust ourselves to God's care by being known and loved by his people, understanding that the cost of such beautiful work is nothing when compared to the gain of dwelling with God. And, and, and being in such close proximity with others is gonna knock off your rough edges, right? It, it's going to form you, it's gonna shape you into someone who can be sent to a lost and dying world against the enemies of God, amen? amen. See, Baal uh, was, was known as a storm god, right? The Phoenicians, they, they believed that he was the one who brought rain and through it uh, uh, prosperity through farming and crop production. And so by shutting down the rain, God was dismantling this false God. Uh, he, he was taking down the power of this God that they were pushing on the nation, right? And so Elijah shows up on the scene. He announces a drought, and suddenly he becomes the most important person in Israel, right? He walks up to him. He says, it's not going to rain again until I say so. Bye. And he just takes off, right? He becomes the most important person in the land. He said, for years, it's not going to rain. And then he bounces, all right, Ahab and Jezebel for years now begin to look for Elijah, right? And 1 Kings 17 covers an over a three-year period uh, and tells us where God is hiding Elijah while the judgment of drought and famine is on the land of Israel. All right, so looking at verse 2, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. All right, so Elijah uh, pronounces judgment on Israel and becomes the focal point of it all. all right, until I say so it won't rain. And then God speaks. Now, I, I'm sure that Elijah knew that God would have him hide, but, but I wonder what he thought it would look like. I, I'm sure he didn't think that God was going to send him into a wilderness with a hidden brook and ravens as his daily DoorDash. I'm pretty sure, like maybe a palace, maybe just like some, some hidden nooks somewhere, right? I'm sure he didn't think he was going to go where he was sent. I wonder if he was tempted to question God's leadership. You want me to go where? To the wilderness. That's where you want me to go, right? Has God ever asked you to do something you didn't want to do? Don't lie to me. Has he done that? Go talk to the person that has offended you, right? Or, or, or give to that person or to that program or to that ministry, right? Or, or I want you to serve in this particular area that needs help, right? And, and, and maybe when God has told you to do something you didn't want to do, maybe in your head you said, God, there are so many different things that I would love to do for you, right? Have you thought that? That there, there's, there's a bunch of other things I'd rather do. You know, I learned a long time ago uh, this, that the will of God is what you and I would do if we knew everything God knows. All right, the will of God is what you and I would do if we knew everything God knows. And by experience, I know that God's will is the absolute best thing for me. But what I can say to you is that it, is, it always stretches me and it is often disorienting, right? It is not what I would do. Sometimes that's how I know what the will of God is. It's like, okay, I wouldn't want to do that, yeah. right? And so God says, Elijah, I, I just made your life pretty hard. You're in danger. Now go to the wilderness and I'll take care of you there, right? God's provision was a brook and ravens, all right? Now, let's think about ravens for a second, all right? Uh, ravens are mentioned 11 times in scripture. Uh, ravens are not a beautiful bird. Uh, they're actually pretty ugly. Um, they're very unattractive and unpleasant. They are ferocious eaters. They're very greedy that uh, they feast on dead things, right? That they are, they are known, how about this? They are known to neglect their young, right? That they are the last thing that you would think will provide for you in a moment of, of adversity, right? right? If you're struggling, you see a dove fly past, you're like, oh, the Lord's here, you know? 
You see a butterfly, you're like, oh, there's hope. If a raven flies around, you, it's waiting for you to die. Right? Like they just don't signify hope at all. Um, Elijah would have seen a, a raven as completely useless to him because they were unclean birds and God's law forbade Hebrews to eat them. So he couldn't even eat that thing he saw flying around, right? And this is what God used to provide for Elijah, right? God's provision comes through unexpected means, right? But the assurance of it is reserved only in a place of obedience. Did you hear that? God's provision comes in unexpected ways, but if you want to be assured that you're gonna get that, Obedience is what you, what you need to, to prescribe to. All right. He said, you will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you food. Where? There. you got to go there. Right? So you can't receive God's radical provision if your hands are full. You can't. You, you will have to put down your need to determine outcomes. You have to. All right. So the question for you is, where is your there? Where's your there? Are, are you obeying the last thing God asked you to do? Are, are you positioned in the last place God asked you to go? Uh, Corey Ten Boom and her sister, uh, they were imprisoned at a place called Ravensbrück in North, Northern Germany. The, I, listen, when I sat down and I thought about this story, uh, the thing that that I was really most drawn to was her issue with the fleas. But as I studied it, I just flipped out when I realized the actual place where it was. They were stationed at Ravensbrook. Did you hear that? Ravensbrook. And in Barracks 28, they had smuggled in a Bible. And for some reason, the guards would never come in to do regular searches or to assault the women at all. all right. it, it was a norm for the guards that were stationed near to go into the rooms and do regular searches and all kinds of sexual assault, all kinds of stuff would happen in these barracks. But for whatever reason, in barracks 28, the guards never came in. They never did their searches. They never assaulted the women. And one day they figured out why. And it wasn't because the building was in disrepair. It wasn't because of the soil bedding. It wasn't because of the backed up plumbing. It was because the building was infested with fleas. They wanted nothing to do with the fleas. They would not go in there because of the fleas, right? The very thing Corey couldn't be thankful for was what God was using to protect them. All right, God's provision comes through unexpected means. See, it, it, it just may be that the thing that you have a hard time being thankful for, your spouse, your kids, the season of life you're in, your job, your health issues, the things that are limiting you, whatever it is, God may be using that thing to protect you and provide for you. See, in the sovereign hand of God, the fleas control the Nazis. In the sovereign hand of God, in, 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 in a famine, the ravens became the food bank. The ravens, right? If God is sovereign, you and I can finally rest from pretending that we are. Notice, just to look a little deeper into this, notice these two objects of provision, all right? So you have the brooks, you have the brook and the ravens, all right? I believe the brook is a picture of God's natural provision in life. All right, the brook of Kareth is a picture of God's common provision in our day-to-day -day lives, right? And, and, and we shouldn't discount the practical providence of God as any less of God's goodness towards us, right? You have a job, you get a paycheck, right? You have a place to live, you have good cleaning, running water, uh, clean running water. No matter how much you're used to it, no matter how routine it gets, never forget that God is the one behind that grace in your life, right? Go drink from the brook, right? That's God's natural and common provision. But what's not normal are ravens coming as room service. All right, that is a picture of God's supernatural provision. All right. When God sees fit, 
he can do something out of the ordinary to make his goodness known in your life. There's testimonies all around the room of moments that he's done this for us. God provides for us naturally and supernaturally. And one of the reasons why uh, this is so hard for us to see as uh, what I would say self-sufficient modern people, right? I, I think one of the reasons why this is hard uh, to see is because we, we do everything we can to provide for ourselves. Yep. We do. And I, I want to say this, it's going to be pretty hard, you know, but I've been a believer for over 20 years and I've been just like examining my whole heart for a long time. And so this is my issue as well but I've also been in ministry for a long time. I've been people watching for a long time as well. And this is what I know about us. Can I tell you? Thank you, Gary, appreciate it. That if we have two decisions in front of us, right? One decision, if we have one decision where we can disobey God to get what we need, or the other decision is that we trust God and we wait for him to get what we need. Many of us will, go the route of disobeying God. I, 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 don't, I don't understand what it is about our hearts, but, but we, we often choose, no, I'm going to go get what I need to get. We, we so value control that waiting on the Lord is traumatic for many of us. Here's the message today. If you've heard nothing I've said to this point, all right, hear this. Here's a message today. You can trust the Lord. You can trust the Lord, right? Jesus said it this way. In the New Testament, Jesus said, consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They don't have storehouses or barns, and yet my Father feeds them. How much more valuable are you than they? You can trust the Lord. Now, uh, it, it would be impressive if God hid Elijah in the wilderness for three years with the brook and the ravens, right? If, if for the whole time he hid him, that'd be pretty impressive, right? But God had more for Elijah. I want you guys to see this. Looking at verse seven, it says, sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. All right, so it's one leap of faith to receive from ravens, right? But to, to believe God is planning provision for you in your next is a whole nother leap. It's another leap, right? God's provision comes through unexpected means, number one. But secondly, God's provision is uncomfortable. Let me break this down for you. God's provision is uncomfortable. Just when you get comfortable with a miracle, some of us have been through this. Just when you get comfortable with a miracle, God stretches you to believe for more. I mean, I don't know how it is for you, but when I read the Bible, you know, I look at the Old Testament, I see the children of Israel, they get delivered out of Egypt. God delivers them, right? And they're, they're in the wilderness. He's taking them from, from Egypt to the promised land. Moses goes up on the mountain to talk to God, and he's gone for a couple weeks, all right, to their credit. But they lose their minds, they literally form a calf, and then they start looking at the calf, worshiping it, saying, you're the one who delivered us out of Egypt. In the New Testament, you got Jesus. He's on a boat with his disciples, and he falls asleep. And as he's asleep, the sea starts to rage, and it looks like it's pretty dangerous. And although Jesus has healed people, although Jesus has cast out demons, although Jesus has raised someone from the dead, they look at him in that moment and they say, do you not care that we're going to perish? I mean, how quickly we forget the miracle of God in our lives. Let me turn this over to us. You're already walking in a miracle. You, you're already walking in a miracle. Why can't you believe for the next one? Think about this, the job you have. How did you even get that job? You probably shouldn't have got that job. You had no business starting a business, but you started one and you're doing pretty good, right? You weren't even qualified for the promotion and you got it. There were many offers on that house that you put an offer on 
And they were offering a lot more than you were offering, but they accepted your offer. Miracles. You were in a car crash and you walked away from it with no limitation, no injury. Miracles. Miracles are happening all around, right? You, you grew up in a household that puts the funk in dysfunctional, right? No, listen, no one taught you how to be married. No one taught you how to raise good kids. Man, you're doing it, right? When you and I sit down, we think about all the dumb things we did in our lives, and then we look around and we see that we are so much better off than we should be. That is a freaking miracle. Can I say that from stage? You and I are walking in miracles already. So let me ask you this question. Why are you so anxious about what God's going to do next? Here's a question. Do you have faith to believe in God's ongoing provision? Do you have faith to believe in God's ongoing provision? See, Elijah, after being fed by ravens in the wilderness, is sent to Zarephath to be fed by a widow. All right, and this must have been incredibly humbling. This must have been so humbling. I mean, no self-respecting Israelite would allow a widowed Gentile woman with a son to provide for him. It must have been really hard for him to do. Right? On top of that, he was sent to Zarephath. Zarephath was where Jezebel was from. And so God was sending Elijah into the Mecca of Baal worship. He was sending him into the heart, guys, the heart of enemy territory, right? Zarephath also in Hebrew means refinery. It means refinery, right? But Elijah goes without protest. And I believe it's because he realized that if God is with him, there's no safer place to be, right? There's no safer place to be. I mean, Aaron nailed it earlier. Psalm 23, God prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. In the valley of Baca, though you walk through the valley of Baca, Psalm 27, he will make it a place of springs. The safest place for you and I to be is in the will of God, obeying his voice. Are you in a Zarephath right now? Are you in a Zarephath? If you're not in a Zarephath, can I just tell you, a Zarephath is coming. All right, it's coming. All right, God's refinement though, listen to this, God's refinement often looks like him causing you to thrive in dangerous places. So he went to Zarephath, verse 10. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may, may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, oh, and bring me please a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Now, I, I love how this story is a faith journey for Elijah, but it's also a, a faith journey for the widow as well, because she's being encountered here too. Right, Elijah asks her for water, which in ancient Eastern culture is a common and expected practice of hospitality to provide water for a stranger. All right, this was likely inconvenient for her, right? But you know, it was within the realm of reason all right, when he asked for water. But then he asked her for bread, and that's when she said, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. See, I, I think we're like the widow. I think we're like her, right? We're willing to give water. Right? We're willing to give the things that don't cost much. Right? It's inconvenient, right? but, but, but we, we kind of like the feeling of saying we gave and we were part of something, so okay, no big deal. Right? We'll, we'll give the water. But, but what's that thing you're hesitant to give? What is that thing? Are, are you giving God your water or are you giving him your bread? I, I thought I was going to get more <laughs> amens on that, but I see that. Are you giving him your water or are you giving him your bread? Uh, Jesus in the New Testament, there's this moment, uh, it's crazy. So in the New Testament, Jesus, he actually goes to a church service 
and he just kind of sits back and he starts people watching, all right? And he's sitting back there and people are coming in and they're giving their offerings and he's watching with his disciples and he sees rich folks come in and they're giving a lot of money, okay? So it says they gave a lot of money and then he watches a widow come in who gives two copper coins and he turns to his disciples and he says, man, she gave more. He said, they gave a lot. They gave from their surplus, but she gave something that actually cost her. She gave everything she had to live on, right? And so I want you to think about this right now. Think about what you're giving God right now. And I'm not talking about your money. I'm talking about your time, talent, and your treasure. Okay, think about this right now. Are you giving from your surplus? Or are you giving God what actually costs you? You know, for this widow, her willingness to accommodate such a ridiculous request from this prophet literally saved her life. It saved her life. Verse 13 says, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and she did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. I mean, just imagine what that was like every day. I mean, imagine going to your jar of flour and to your jug of oil every single day, knowing you've contributed nothing to it. And for years, it produces for you. I mean, think about it. I mean, they, they were walking in a miracle every single day. Every day, they're walking in a miracle. Uh, Corey Ten Boom and her sister, Betsy, they arrived in Ravensbrook, Barracks 28, with a Bible and a bottle of liquid vitamin drops. I mean, it's a miracle story how they're even able to smuggle that into their barracks, but they were able to do it. They had a Bible and a bottle of liquid vitamin drops. And Corey soon discovered that 25 other women had the same vitamin deficiency as her sister. They too needed the vitamin drops that she had. All right, and I want you to listen to how this unfolded. This is in her, in her book. Um, this is in her book. It says, what should I do, Lord? Asked Corey. If I give the drops to these women, there will only be enough to last a day. Even if I save the drops for Betsy, there will only be enough to last a month. Corey knew what she must do. She lined up all the women who were ill and gave them the drops. Strangely enough, she lined the women up again the next day, and there were still enough drops for everyone. She tried it again the next day and the next. Still, there were enough. Every time she tilted the bottle, a drop appeared at the tip of the glass stopper. It just couldn't be, said Corey. She held it up to the light, trying to see how much was left, but the dark brown glass was too thick to see through. There was a woman in the Bible, said Betsy, whose oil jar was never empty. She turned to the story of the book of 1 Kings. They read about the poor widow of Zarephath who had cared for Elijah. She continued to have oil in her jar and flour in her flour bin, no matter how much she used. See, it was one thing to believe that such things happened thousands of years ago, but another thing to believe that it could happen today, and yet it happened. Don't try to explain it, said Corey to Betsy. Just accept it as a surprise from a father who loves you. Then one day, a young Dutch woman, also in the prison camp, came to Corey. Look what I've got for you, she said, vitamins. Somehow she had stolen them from the staff room. There were several huge containers of vitamins in the yeast compound. We'll finish the drops first, thought Corey. But that night, no matter how long she held the bottle upside down or how hard she shook it, not another drop appeared. Not another drop appeared. All right, God's provision comes through unexpected means. 
God's provision is uncomfortable. It's disorienting. It'll stretch you. And lastly, God's provision is unconventional. All right, I want you to think with me. Think about Elijah's progression of growth in this story. Right, just in 1 Kings 17, think of his progression of growth. Right, first, he was formed and discipled in community. Second, he was used by God and then hidden for years. Third, in the hiding and in the dark, he met God in faithful service. Uh, we're not going to uh, read through it, but um, you know, basically after pronouncing judgment to the king of Israel, um, Elijah probably thought that he was pretty important, right? You go and do such a powerful thing, you step to the king and you pronounce judgment. You're thinking, okay, my, my ministry from here is going to take off, right? It's going to take off, right? But then God sends him into the wilderness, and then he sends him to live with the widow and her son in relative obscurity, right? And he ministers faithfully to this family for years, for years. There's this point during his time living with them that her son dies and Elijah prays for his life to return to him, and the boy rises from the dead. And this is the first account of, of resurrection, of human resurrection, a resurrection miracle in the Bible. It's the first time you see it in scripture is in Elijah's life. See, we mistakenly think that when we serve God, we're helping others. But what I would say to you and what I've learned, this is my experience, God uses our faithful service to reveal himself to us. Many people will say who have been to the Christmas toy outreach or Joan when we do the food pantry or uh, Vicky, when we do the community store on Saturday, many of us will say this, that we think we're going there to pour out for other people. We think we're going there to serve other people. And guess who we meet there? Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. We meet him. Elijah met God in faithful service. And so he was formed and discipled in the community. He was used by God and then hidden for years. He met God in faithful service, and lastly, he received much more than he gave. I want you guys to hear the last verse of 1 Kings 17. This is after her son is risen from the dead. This is what the widow says to Elijah. She says, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. See, Elijah would later become known as a key figure in the preservation of the worship of Yahweh. I mean, he single-handedly confronted and defeated Ahab and Jezebel's attempt to replace Yahweh as Israel's God. And, and I'm confident that the affirmation from this widow in his time of faithful service was something that God used to make him the mighty prophet that he became. Amen. Why don't you stand with me? Um, it was her affirmation that made the difference. Um, I have two stories of this um, that have happened in my life. So the first one is when I first uh, became a believer, one of the first things that um, I felt like the Lord told me was, uh, you're, gonna preach my, you're gonna preach my word. As evidenced by the fact that I completely, like in a moment, I stopped cursing. All right, Amy will tell you, I had a filthy mouth. I gave my life to Jesus and I like forgot how to curse. I, I'm serious. And so right away I was like, okay, God, I guess I'm, I'm gonna preach. And so um, quickly after that, um, I got invited to Modesto to preach. And this was big time. I mean, I, you know, I kind of knew some of these people, but it was, it was a big deal. And I worked really hard on the message and, you know, I did as best as I could uh, to, to prepare and I got up there and I preached and, you know, it was all right, whatever, you know, and I got down from the, the pulpit when I was done. And, and although I knew God had told me, hey, you're called to preach, there was still some doubt in my mind. Like I still didn't fully know this is what God wanted me to do. And I stepped down from the pulpit and the, the, the strongest believer that I knew 
probably the person that I respected the most of the Christian faith. Her name was Mary Williams, who's now my mother-in-law. She came up to me and she said, hey, I was talking to some leaders. And we know for a fact you were called to preach. And never again have I doubted. It was the affirmation from someone who knew me. Second one is Amy and I, we, we started a marriage ministry. And quickly as we, after we started the marriage ministry, this couple called us and, um, you know, they were in dire straits. They, you know, they just needed a lot of help. They needed crisis counseling. And so we invited them over to our house and they sat down at our kitchen table and for about two hours, I mean, we just threw the kitchen sink at them, not physically, but like, we just, I mean, we just, everything we knew about marriage that God was teaching us about marriage, we just threw it, threw it, threw it, threw it. And they went from being discouraged. Uh, they went from a marriage that was done to literally in that one conversation, they were encouraged that they literally walked out of our house, smiling, holding hands. And I remember when they shut the door, um, Amy said something to me and, you know, I, I had been preaching for a while at that point and it, it's pretty common. Please don't do this after service. It'll be really awkward. But <laughs> after I would finish preaching, people would come to me and say, man, Sean, you're anointed. And I'd be like, thank you. You're anointed. I had heard people say that a lot, man, you're anointed, you're anointed. And like, I liked it. Like it was nice. Like it was, it made me feel good, but I don't know if I ever really believed it. But then that night, when that couple walked out of our house and they shut the door, Amy looks at me and she says, man, you're anointed. And for the first time I said, I think I am. <laughs> Why? Because it was the affirmation of someone that if anyone knows that I'm not anointed, it's Amy Patterson, right? <laughs> You're anointed and changed my life. That there's something that happens in community, guys. This is much of the provision we need. I was just talking to a few friends the other day. We were talking about how crazy it is as Americans that we, you know, we live in a cul-de-sac. It's like everyone owns a lawnmower, everyone owns a car. You know, we, we're all, we're so dead set on individualism to just do our own thing. I just said, man, what if there was a community of people that were just committed to journeying together? What if there was a group of people in my life that was just committed to me no matter how bad it gets. I mean, like I'm telling you, when the Warriors lose, I'm hard to be around, right? When the Broncos stink, it's really tough, all right? And when the Cowboys are bad, I'm really mean to Cowboys fans too, right? But what would it look like if we had a community of people that were committed to affirming each other? It's like Elijah, I always receive more than I give in a space like this. And I believe God will do the same for you. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Hmm. Lord, I thank you for the fleas. God, I thank you for the brook. God, I thank you for the ravens. God, I thank you for the widows that you bring into my life. God, I thank you for your resurrected son, Jesus, who paid the price for your radical generosity towards me. God, thank you. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Manifest your presence. Meet us here, God. So, 
few questions. Is God asking you to do something that you don't want to do? Listen, the will of God is what you would do if you knew everything God knew. Where is your there? Are, are, are you positioned in the last place God told you to go? Are, are you doing the last thing God asked you to do? Do you have faith to believe in God's ongoing provision? The safest place to be is in the center of God's will, obeying his voice. Amen. Are you giving God your water or are you giving him your bread? Are you giving him your surplus or are you giving him something that actually costs you? And lastly, are you committed to God's unconventional process of growing you up in him? With all heads bowed, all eyes closed. If you're here today and you say, Sean, I know that God is knocking on the door of my heart. I, I know that I need to respond. I wanna tell you, you're in the safest place to say yes. If you're here, you say, Sean, I need to respond today to the voice of God. If you're here, you say that, just raise your hand. We just wanna pray for you. We just wanna pray. I see you in the back. Anyone else? Another one right here. Amen, I see you, sister. Thank you. Anyone else? Got two hands, three hands raised. Anyone else? Lord, I just thank you for those who be bold enough to raise their hand. God, thank you for your intervening grace. God, thank you for how radical you are in chasing us down. God, to receive from you is what we all desperately need. But God, save us from our self-sufficiency. God, help us to see the ways in which you are providing for us. And help us, God, to be bold enough to obey. God, if you send us into a wilderness, we'll go, knowing, God, that you prepare a table for us in that place. And if you ask us to do things that are uncomfortable, God, we know that it's hard. We know that it's disorienting, but God, give us the faith See, I, I love that, that man in the scripture that says, I believe, but help my unbelief. God, I just feel by your presence, by, by your spirit, there are those in here that would say that same thing. I mean, I believe, but help my unbelief. Would you minister to their hearts right now? Thank you, Lord. Um. I think there's an invitation <clears throat> for some of us in here that the Father wants to um, specifically heal your heart and restore childlikeness. Um, a, a child in a healthy home never has to worry about receiving what they need from their parents. And for some of you, you actually have a there's a block where there's a fear of receiving because you grew up in a home that did not have a, a good father where uh, you could trust that he would provide for you and trust that he would be there for you. So for some of you, I think there's a healing thing that the Lord wants to do in your heart this morning um, where he'll start a journey of just beginning to heal that place in you and actually restore childlikeness, restore innocence so that you'll in your heart be in a place where you're open to receive. So can I actually, um, can I have our prayer team come forward? Some of us are already down here, but. Um, we're gonna kind of flow here for a little bit, but if you need prayer specifically for anything that we've identified this morning, um, and also for that word about childlikeness, um, can you come forward because we wanna pray for you. Um, we're, we're a house that believes in laying on hands. We're a house that believes that God moves when we pray. 
So we can't force you to come up, but uh, we believe that God does things uh, here at this altar. So if any of that stuff relates to you and you want to receive prayer, please come forward. We want to, we want to pray for you and believe God with you. Somebody told me last night that they had a dream that God was telling them that somebody might be here today that is in active addiction and that is looking for a way out. If that's you, then um, come up and, and get some prayer because God wants to free you from it, and he can. for you father i just thank you for your people god i thank you for the moment that we're in as a body god i thank you for all of the provision that you're pouring out on this house god we we desire to live in your presence we desire to know you to dwell with you to journey together in you. God, teach us how to be the type of people that can honor you in community. God, we thank you for every single person in this room. God, I pray a blessing on them. God, help us to be more mindful of all the ways in which you were coming to us. But we wanna meet you in faithful service. God, we wanna meet you where we're at. As Aaron talked about today coming in, that there's a kind of a heaviness in the room, God. That there are those maybe who are walking through a, a hard time, maybe even a Zarephath in their life, God. God, meet us in the dark. Meet us in these moments. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil. There's got to be light coming from somewhere. Thank you. Thank you that you're near. Lord, as we go our, our separate ways this week and as we spend time with family, some are traveling, some are going out of the state, some are spending time with folks in their lives that they just don't get a lot of time with. God, I pray that you would help us to carry the aroma of your son, Jesus, Lord. Help us to honor you in those spaces, Lord. Guide us, be with us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.